Thank you for a very, very beautiful introduction. Um, every time I read uh, Poets and Players, I know that there's a presence in the room which will make me read more slowly, which will make me look up at the audience, and I hope will make me pause after the poems. And that presence is, of course, that of Linda Chase. And I feel she's probably here today in some form or other. So uh, it's, it's wonderful that her work has continued with such uh, an inspired uh, aftermath it, with Poets and Players. Um, this seems to be um, an age of plagiarism. Uh, you, some of you will have followed the amusing tales of plagiarism in Australia and in the UK. In ancient times, and I wrote a book called The First Poets about ancient Greece, when a poet wanted his poems to be read, and they generally wanted their poems, poems to be read, they didn't want to be recognized as poets, they would pass them off under the name of another poet. So if I wanted to read my poems, I would say, this is a new poem by Michael Simmons Roberts. <laughs> and you would think, ah, he's an award-winning poet, I will read this poem, rather than this is a poem by Joe Bloggs, me. And uh, so the, the poem that attracted most imitators, if you like, and that created the greatest anthology of imitations, reverse plagiarisms, was anachronism. And there's a, a volume of poems now called the Anachron Tale, which are poems attributed to Anachron which weren't by him. I translated some of these from my book, and I'd just like to begin with one of them. Anachron, the Teian singer, in a dream saw and called to me. I ran and kissed him. I hugged him. He was old, but still quite handsome, and love was working in him. The wine scented his lips. Since he was old, unstable on his pins, Eros clutched his hand and guided him. The poet lifted from his brow the garland and passed it to me, and it smelled of him. I was a foolish boy. I placed it on my own head as a crown, and ever since, I have not lived a single moment without love. As a small boy in uh, Capistrano in, in California, a schoolmate of mine died. Her name was Agatha, and this is a strange little elegy that came to me much later. What is it like in heaven, Agatha? I see you in those tight scuffed shoes, now dangling not over the playground wall, and your sharp knees and the frayed serge skirt of your school uniform, but off a black cloud hard against the blue, they swing to and fro, to and fro. What can you see so high above my head in the tree and the hill? Am I down here? Is your house? Is your lame cat, Dorcas, with whiskers on the left side of her face and a broken tail? Can you see us? Do you want to now? Recalled by the school alarm, the smell of asphalt softening in the sun and the effulgent hay? Or is all this fading, faded, faded out? If so, if your eyes have been able to uproot themselves from us, do they feed on an entire firmament? Is it blue? And is this as though it never had been at all, where I stand, where you used to sit on the wall? What is it like, dear skinny Agatha, with your sharp ribs under a stained singlet, your flat chest with nipples stuck on like round plasters, like valves, like coppers tipped slightly on smooth sand. We walked on the level shore at Capistrano, gathering dark sand dollars and coolie hat shells, first we were five and six, then six and seven. What is it like, your straight lips pursed, your gray eyes, Agatha, gazing at a sky you're new in and new to? And was it, what is it like, your Agatha, without me? What color is your hair now? Do you wear it? In a, bat, in a bun, or still in blade, braids, or piled high up, in a, or in a ponytail. I stand beneath your cloud and ask, and ask. For the last um, 12 years, it appears, I have been writing, writing a book called, uh, was, was to be called The Life, uh, uh, Lives of the Novelists, but um, someone else got there before me, so it's now called uh, The Novel, A Biography. Uh, this poem is about the reading I had to do for this rather vast book. It's over a thousand pages. Um, and no one ever told me when I set off that people had written so many novels. Especially in the 20th century, that came as a terrible shock. I thought the novel was a 19th century phenomenon. In any event, <laughs> I read the novel after novel, and fortunately I traveled quite a lot by train. And so this poem, Death of the Novel, it begins by being about, um, about the deaths of characters in novels. And the line you kindly quoted is from this poem. 
At Preston Station, Yevgeny Bazarov gave up the ghost. Having found his Russian heart, a medical vocation, just starting out for real, becoming good against his nature, he died. My train was late again and the snow drifted across the platform. Closing the book, I brushed the ice off my cheeks, blew my nose, I stamped my boots to get the circulation going, and so returned to the present tense. Thomas Woodenbrook, at the height of summer, arriving at St. Pancras, the evening light in prisons play on steel, slate, and brickwork, clamped his rotting teeth. His heart stopped and he slumped beside me. I folded him away. I lost Anna Karenina under the station clock in Baltimore. Speeding to Paris, Swan, I abandoned you. The train had broken down just outside Turin when Gerald Kreitsch arrived at the hollow basin of snow, slipped and fell, and as he fell, something broke in his soul and immediately he went to sleep. I have lost on trains at stations so many characters, Don Quixote, Mrs. Ramsey, Nepomuk, a mere child little Dombey, counting the waves, Nell, and Madame's Bovary one and two, sweet Madame de Renal and her luminous glowworm, and worse, the very worst, Hurstwood, who, ragged and spent in his small cold room, began to take off his clothes, but stopped first with his coat and tucked it along the crack under the door. After a few moments in which he reviewed nothing but merely hesitated, he turned the gas on again, but he applied no match. On his tombstone, Norman Douglas had them carved, Omnes eodem cocimor, we all reached the same board. His final words in character, get these fucking nuns away from me. <laughs> they die also, the authors, turning not into ghosts like ordinary pilgrims, but into stories as real if they wrote truly as what they wrote. Stevenson, for instance, still young when he died, is told and retold. Henry James adored him, man and boy, savoring him in his words, reshaping him as his song, a child of air that lingers in the garden there. Samoa made him to Sitala, teller. There he died, decanting a good bottle of burgundy. Omnes eodem. Conrad called on his friend Stephen Crane at Dover. It was Crane's last day in England. He lay in a hotel bedroom with a large window looking onto the sea. He had been very ill, and Mrs. Crane was taking him to some place in Germany. But one glance at that wasted face was enough to tell me it was the most forlorn of hopes. Crane said, I am tired. And he said, give my love to your wife and child. Looking back from the door, I saw he had turned his head on the pillow. Conrad watched from the threshold, noting how he was staring out of the window at the sails of a cutter yacht that glided slowly like a dim shadow against the gray sky. He pulled the sea around him, tight around his shoulders. It was cold. I stamped my boots. The train arrives. As you um, grow older, uh, you always imagine, I think, that you are in middle age. But there comes a time, I remember the other week I said to a student, middle age is difficult, and he said to me, was it? <laughs> Another student asked me if the, if, the, if the draft I had dodged was the Korean draft. No. So this poem is really about coming to terms with being much older than you would wish you were, um, and it's also about uh, taking retirement, uh, but not quite taking retirement, uh, things which are true. Um, You'll notice that, that, that there is a lot of quoted material in these poems, uh, and it's easy to drift in and out of quotations. I've started using syllabics, and syllabics are a wonderful instrument for keeping too much subjectivity out of the poem, and also making it possible to fold in as, a, as, as if you were on, on the great Bake Off, folding dough, as it were, fold in uh, other people's, other people's um, sweetness and, and zest. After hours. And then, to tell the truth, I didn't much care. I'd done my time and over. I wanted out. Just as I was going, they summoned me back. The dumb thing is, I went. They offered money. I had money enough. Yet, when they added, 
You can keep your office and title. Stupid, I agree. On short time, I sit in the same chair, at the same table, work piled before me. Colleagues patronize me. I am still professor without professing. A spiderless cobweb. While outside the sun climbs to the trees, and times not a clock but seasons, the kind an old man requires to make peace and walk into the woods like a pioneer released from the routines of culture and employment. I didn't think I cared, and then I stayed, and the one who said, I've had enough, walked away and wrote me off. Good riddance, then. But I can't help wondering who he was what he took with him, where he went. I sit in the same chair at the work table and think of him, not enviously. Did he go to Cornwall, where I thought I'd one day settle in Foy or Paul Ruin and walk the cliffs at the end of England and the end of life, loving the clouds and even the shrill seagulls? Did he go to Mexico and make a place brief perhaps but radiant and very raw, having thrown his books and papers on a skip? an alp of literature, and chosen mountains, real mountains, the pine and cactus, coyotes and gopher snakes, grey eagles, sopilotes and ocote smoke, pots of red rice black beans, hot on the brazier, at night so many stars he found his place and gave up the glad ghost there. Did he stay at home, his alp of literature intact, wearing his millet mayo velcro climbing shoes, making his way with hiking poles, mammoth, galaxy, super dry climbing rope, crike climbing gloves, crampons, ice axes, ice spoons, leaving a sequence of huts and bivouacs as he climbed the texts. Does he reach a summit? And there, in thin air, does he find wings and rise? Is heaven that way? To tell the truth, I care for him, for all of him, cliff, star, and summit. His time is never up. I close my eyes. He's there for sure, wearing my face, sunburned, windburned. He's written me off, so he never chides me. I walk in his prints through the thick cliff-edged grass, or up the flinty sendero to the stars, or through deep snow and out across the ice fields. My selves disown me, but they remain my selves. Though my feet are dry, my hands clean, and I sit in precisely the same chair, at this table, fingering my mammoth galaxy super dry climbing rope, wondering, will it take my weight? I don't know how many of you have um, spelling checks on your, on your word processors and, and computers. I once typed in, also poor Yorick, and the spelling check came back, also poor Yorick. So I wrote a poem called, also poor Yorick. And this is really about Yorick, uh, Yorick's sort of what would you call it? Uh, eternity. Yorick's heart is moved. How beautiful, he says, and grasps then what it must mean to be human, returning rested from the afterlife into the lovely new resurrection. Bare feet with the worms and roots still in them, the puddles cool between their metatarsals. The skulls bathe with joy and all are grinning, popping their knuckles, counting their vertebrae, and now they dance alone and now join hands. And as they dance there in their ribs and rigging, in each gray skeleton, a robin perches, plumping its feathers, pulsing out its song, red and the twittering's blood as well as music. Never has he witnessed a scene so vital, the dance of life, the scripture guaranteed. Faster a shadow shorten and noon rises, the skeletons spin and conga, into the air, making a cloud, a halo on the sun. He takes his spade and sets it on his shoulder. He's old. Till now, he's known so much regret. He's buried his grandparents and his parents, his kings and queens, his brothers and his friends, his lovers, all of them consumables, pulvis, kinis, nihil, the bones bearing in their chalk wholeness so much love and light. In his own graveyard, with the deer departed, one unfamiliar skeleton stands up, tall, gracious, folding down his finger bones over two holes, where his hurt feet strike stone, sparks from the rusty nails, and in his side a spear, perched for a phoenix, Jesus Christ, risen in this garden, 
and the wounds or the bones that keep the marks of wounds are seen. It's noon, there are no shadows, this is true. He raised them and himself is rising up. Also, poor Yorick, that was judgment, it is over. Later in the day, the prince arrives, stepping from his script as from a carriage drawn up among the holes in which the dead waited and from which they are all delivered. By just like an audience, when the play is over, elbowing their coats into the dark. Anxious, a bit deranged, he finds occasion to hold a conversation with Skull. Is it a skull or a stone that looks like a skull? The heads are all gone to heaven, Jesus too. The sexton himself put off his flesh and followed. Ophelia was already on her star. Poor prince, alone with just a book of ballads, with just the plot nothing can raise him from. Two, two more poems. One is a very short one called Family Tree, um, and uh, it too has a slightly religious inflection, you'll notice. It's about the world before, before the creation, and um, Christ is foreseeing things. <coughs> Watching his creatures with a filial sorrow, Christ, not a shepherd yet, not yet a man, propped on a cloud at the edge of things, his hands unbroken on his hips, wonders who he'll be, and knows it's up to Adam to determine what human pleasure might feel like and what pain to the Son of God, Adam who's in mourning, Adam whose maker has withdrawn the kingdom, all for a fruit, a serpent, and a rib. The Son of God sees Eve grow plump as a pillow, bearing a mallet and three nails inside her, bearing a spear, a sponge, and vinegar. And the last poem is a carol for Edward Taylor. Edward Taylor is a, an English poet who emigrated to the United States in the 17th century. Um, he was a clergyman who was much besotted with George Herbert after, after Herbert had, as it were, passed from fashion. And every time he, uh, he uh, celebrated communion, he would write a poem. And some of the poems, are, none of the poems is entirely good. And some of the poems are incredibly silly, but some of them have the most amazing lines I've ever read. And I use one of his lines as the last line and a recurring line in this poem, a carol for Edward Taylor. And it seems that every Christmas I write an Easter poem, and every Easter I write a Christmas poem. This is a communion of saints. This is an Easter poem written at Christmas. Long fields of yellow wheat in Palestinian sun are ripening into flesh. The vineyards on the hill bring forth a salty fruit. There where the bread was torn off of the human loaf, where years began to count because a child was born, I come to eat my word. Before me at the rail is Stephen with the stones turned into loaves by love, and James of Zebedee carries his singing head. Peter and Philip bear splinters of their cross trees. Bartholomew, his skin, rolled up beneath his arm. Thomas from India with his appalling spear, and sweet Sebastian too, God's willing porcupine, and Agatha whose heart is caroling with hurt, Perpetua with her own new baby clutched at her breast, Felicity her slave whose child will not be born, attended by the beasts that tore them limb from limb and slouch now tame and meek to Bethlehem and kneel the way the sheep and ox knelt on that first day. Cyprian and Polycarp both try to sneak away, but drawn by the infant host out, dazzling from his crib the flare of martyr's fires, Antipas on the grill, Domitian's brazen bull and all the melting saints that lit his jubilees, and later La Puchelle, and in a northern town, Cranmer and Ridley too, transcendent kin making the tongues of flame speak so we understood. They climbed their cavalry, carrying such precious gifts as Africa can spare. There where the wine was spilled out of the virgin's womb, belief and disbelief, faithful and faithless, kneel, because whatever's true, a child is going to grow on whom we can impress fear, hatred, and desire. A child we will impale, and plant in every grave. We do it by the book. I come to eat my word. Thank you.